Welcome, everybody. So drug-resistant infections and neglected tropical diseases are urgent public health priorities, but the current antibiotic pipeline is broken. How can non-profit drug developers repair it to counter the spread of antimicrobial resistance? Welcome to our webinar, organized by GARD-P, the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Programme. My name is Claire Dool and I'm your moderator. According to WHO, AMR is one of the top 10 global health threats. It particularly affects low and middle income countries, including many African countries. Developing drugs for AMR faces unique challenges, inadequate funding, weak regulatory frameworks, and a lack of infrastructure and expertise. Over the past two decades, a non-profit drug development model has emerged that brings together the power of the private and public sectors to increase investment in research and development for AMR. In this webinar, we're gonna look at the benefits of this model, but also the challenges it faces due to competing and shifting priorities of donors and pharmaceutical companies. So I have some experts with me. They are representatives of three organizations who are strong advocates of this non-profit drug development model. Uh, please welcome Laura Piddock, Scientific Director of GARD-P, the Global Antibiotic Research and De Development Partnership, Monique Wasuna, Eastern Africa Director of DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, and Pietro Turilli, Senior Vice President, External Affairs, the TB Alliance. So we're really keen to hear from you during this discussion, and we'd like to take your questions. So you will see that there's a slide coming up now which says how you can communicate and how you can submit your questions. So do put them in the questions window and we'll review and respond to as many as possible after the webinar, but we really want to do it while our experts are online with us. And of course, we want to hear from you, but also we would encourage you to tweet and to use various hashtags uh, there's a hashtag power of antibiotics and of course you'll know that there's at guard p underscore amr so we hope to be able to communicate really well with you over the next hour so let's get started and we're going to get started with a quick fire round just to set the scene and i'm going to e ask each of our representatives why was their organization set up and what gap, very importantly, was it filling? So I'm going to go in order of age. And I understand, Pietro, that TB Alliance is the oldest. It was set up 23 years ago. So Pietro, very briefly, what was the gap that your organization was filling when it was set up? So good morning, good afternoon, Claire. I thought you were talking about my age, but just jumping in. Uh, yes, TB Alliance was uh, set up 23 years ago to address a very specific issue, and that was around um, the need for further development of therapeutics of new drugs for the treatment of tuberculosis, because there had been um, uh, a huge hiatus in terms of any drug development and the, br the bringing the research development and bringing of any new TB drugs to market. And so that is our single mandate and focus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Money DNDI set up 20 years ago. So what gap was it filling when you did set up 20 years ago? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from wherever you're watching us. Uh, so Claire, if you allow me 30 seconds, uh, just to say who we are and um, uh, what the neglected diseases are so that they can understand what gap we are feeling. So uh, DNDI is a not-for-profit research and development organization uh, that discovers, develops, and uh, accelerates access to urgently needed treatments for neglected diseases. And neglected tropical diseases, according to WHO, there are 20 of them. And these are diseases that are infectious and are preventable and uh, they affect about 1.7 billion people uh, 
globally, and 40% of the, those diseases are found within the African continent. Um, so DMDI, as you correctly said, was created 20 years ago to feel, um, you know, because there was a frustration from the doctors uh, in the field looking after the patients, and also the patients themselves, because there was really no treatment, no medicines that were effective, affordable, easy to use, uh, you know, the, the ones that were there and safe, uh, really and unaffordable. And so that we were then created to fill that research and development gap for treating uh, patients with neglected uh, diseases. And also there was, you know, um, funding really was not there. Uh, there was lack of funding at that time. Um, and the neglected uh, tropical diseases received a small fraction of global uh, health funding. And so um, we were created to fill that gap. The pipeline was empty. And it's because of the, uh, res the, the research and development um, uh, model that was there was a profit making one. And therefore, you know, the patients who are very poor, neglected diseases occurs in very poor communities. So um, they don't have purchasing power there to buy these medicines and therefore lack of uh, medicines for these people. So research and development gap and the funding gap. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for explaining that to us, a research and a funding gap, and exactly as your initiative is, it is neglected diseases. Uh, Laura, Guard P is relatively the new kid on the block, just five years old. So explain a little bit about your organisation and why it was needed, the gap it was filling. Thank you and hello everyone. So uh, GARP was established in 2016 in response to decades long decline in development of new antibiotics to combat the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance. And this is because many of the world's large pharmaceutical companies had stopped antibiotic R&D. And in the main, this was due to a lack of commercial interest. So GARP is vital in introducing an alternative non-profit model that could in partnership with the public and private sectors and unconstrained by commercial considerations, focus on developing new antibiotics whilst aiming to ensure that they are accessible and affordable for those in need and can focus very much on the gaps that no other is filling. So although it was established in 2016 and we were very grateful to be incubated by DNDI, we became an independent foundation, as you said, five years ago and it's our fifth birthday this year so delighted to be here. Thank you very very much and as you have all been saying that when you were set up there just uh, wasn't the interest there wasn't the research or the development of these drugs perhaps because there was no commercial interest and there wasn't funding. Now, you've come up with this uh, non-profit drug development model. There's a few nuances within that model, but what we're going to do now is to get a brief description of the different models, but really to focus on what has it achieved before we look at some of the challenges that these models are facing today. Uh, Pietro, I understand TB Alliance and DNDI, you're both following a similar model, the product development partnership model. Can you very, very briefly describe us what this model is? Thank you, Claire. And you've touched upon some of the, the salient elements, right? So we are nonprofits. Uh, we we are established um, and, and um, Laura will then comment on, on Guard P and the similarities and the differences, but we're all established, broadly speaking, to, to address, uh, to research, development, provide access to new health therapeutics, vaccines, products uh, for underserved markets. And when we speak of underserved markets, as, as Monique mentioned, we're talking about mainly uh, neglected diseases tropical neglected diseases that disproportionately impact uh, people in uh, LMIC countries. And the other key elements are around our funding model that is um, primarily uh, supported through public funding and philanthropic funding. And of course, the fact that we are, are set up to be relatively small and agile. So to, to try to keep our overhead costs down and our infrastructure footprint as small as possible, 
by working through a partnership model with others uh, globally. So at, at a very high level, I, I think that that would be uh, a snapshot of the PVP model um, as, as we see it. And what has it achieved, this PDP model, uh, for, for you? What sort of results have you got over the years? So we, we have achieved results. And speaking in the context of TB Alliance, um, there are two very salient ones. One was in 2015, the launching of a, a pediatric fixed dose combination for TB uh, for children under, under 25 kilos in weight. Um, that a clearly neglected and underserved market within the the vastly underserved uh, target group for for TB. Um, and then more recently in 2019, we had a new drug, Pritominid, that has been approved and is now, as of December last year, uh, included in the WHO guidelines for the treatment of DRTB as part of a multi-drug regimen, BPAL, BPAL-M. Um, that is all oral and six months of treatment. So uh, a huge improvement in terms of treatment for some of the more severe forms of TB. Uh, and th really the, the, new, the new kid on the block in terms of, of regimen um, for unfortunately a very, very long uh, period of time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank, well, thank you indeed. And as you say, those more extreme forms of TB, those multi-drug resistant forms of yes. TB, that you've been able to plug that gap thanks to this product development partnership. Uh, Monique, uh, you also have this model, the product development partnership model that Pietro's just explained. What would you say it has achieved for you over the past few years? and decades even in your case? Okay, so uh, first of all, the, uh, our model uh, puts uh, needs of patients first um, uh, without generating profit as uh, uh, Pietro has said uh, from his R&D efforts. Uh, we have three main pillars uh, in our mission uh, that is innovate, save lives, uh, we also uh, foster inclusive and uh, sustainable uh, solutions and advocate for change. We, we speak up. Uh, our D&D uh, our model is really a virtual, uh, it's like a virtual orchestra. Uh, it's a collaborative partnership model uh, built on very strong partnerships. Um, in fact, without, you know, we don't have our own labs. Uh, we don't have our own laboratories. We, we don't have our own health facilities um you know pharmacies and, and things like that we don't have so our strength is in our partners we collaborate uh, with uh, partners that have uh, all this setup um so our partners include the ministries of health pharmaceutical companies uh researchers patients and um and communities academia um so we have really uh, over 20 established uh, partners um so DNDI also has established uh, research networks in the regions uh, that are affected with neglected diseases um, and um, you know tries to strengthen uh, the research and development ecosystem. Uh, so uh, our achievements are quite many uh, within the time that uh, we have. Uh, so we, I can just say that we have in the last 20 years uh, we have developed 12 new treatments for for six deadly and neglected diseases and thus saving millions of lives. But I just want to use one example of sleeping sickness to illustrate uh, the journey. Um, so together with our partners, uh, the DNDI developed a new treatment called fexinidazole, um, which is an oral compound uh, for sleeping sickness. Uh, 15 years ago, there were you know, very toxic treatments that were being given and um, it, killed, it killed one in 20 of the patients. One in 20 would die because of the uh, effects of treatment. And um, our patients described this treatment as having fire in their veins. Uh, but today, uh, you know, fexinidazole is an oral, oral treatment and it's given for uh, 10 days and can be given at home, it's safe. Um, and uh, we also have another compound that, um, a cosiborol that you know, it's just one treatment, one tablet that you'll take 
and you get treated of the sleeping sickness. And this will help towards the last mile of eliminating uh, African sleeping sickness. And so um, this is not just our success alone, but success with partners, everybody who was involved. Um, so, you know, our partners are everything, especially the Human African uh, Trypanosomiasis um, platform, which is a hard platform, uh, which really uh, continues to support um, uh, this elimination of uh, sleeping sickness. So I can give that as an example. Um, well, thank you. you. You speak, and it's very eloquent, of a virtual orchestra of partners, but we see some very concrete results there. And thank you for sharing that very concrete result on uh, sleeping sickness. And I would also encourage uh, the people who are watching this webinar today, uh, if you have uh, specific questions, please do submit them. We will be taking questions from you. So questions about some of the uh, achievements of this uh, public-private partnership models. We've heard some of the achievements from TB Alliance. We've heard from Monique on the sleeping sickness, one of many achievements there. Um, Laura, you explained briefly your model at the beginning. Tell us in the, the past five years, what would you say it's achieved? And perhaps just go broader for us. Um, in general, what would you say are the overall benefits of this non-profit drug development model? So, uh, GARP has already achieved uh, numerous uh, things, particularly neonatal sepsis, working with our partners. We also work across different sectors, academia, industry, government, non-government, etc., as uh, the previous speakers. Um, but what we tend to do is focus on populations and geographies from a public health perspective. So the Graham report uh, eloquently showed that the greatest burden of drug resistance, indeed 1.27 million per year, were documented in 2019 data alone to die from uh, drug resistant infections. And the greatest burden of that is borne by those in low and middle income countries and also particular vulnerable populations such as babies and children. So we focus on populations and geographies from a public health perspective. So we do focus uh, some of our work on babies and children, as well as programs on sexually transmitted infections. Uh, we have a, a phase three clinical trial, uh, which we have successfully uh, been carrying out and we will hope to be reporting the outcome of that later this year. For neonatal sepsis, working with our partners, we've already established in various sites, including low and middle income countries, uh, the, uh, from observing the infections in those babies, the drug resistant infections in those babies, as a prelude to starting out a big trial later this year with adaptive trial, trying out different combinations of new antibiotics. We've done all the groundwork for that and the necessary work to make sure those drugs can be used in babies. Um, we are less risk averse to explore a potential product. We're not seeking a commercial gain. What we're seeking to do is get treatments to those that need them wherever they are in the world. It doesn't have to be a lower middle income country, but clearly um, there are uh, many underserved populations in such parts of the world. And this allows organizations like Garby to focus on those emerging threats. So this collaborative approach, these projects with little or no initial commercial value, uh, lo local and multilateral approaches, and this isn't just for research and development, it's for access as well. And we work on multiple projects with regional partners, as do the other organizations, and that's key here. It's it really important that those that are going to be using the new treatments are part of the solution, helping to do the research and develop those treatments for using in their parts of the world, wherever they are, UK, Africa, further afield. So as you say, it's really about meeting global public health needs and the best use of public money for a public return, because we know that money, especially in today's straightened times, is one of the challenges. Let's have a look at some of the challenges 
uh, whether that's donor money. Also, at the beginning, we were mentioning that uh, there was little interest from the pharmaceutical industry because uh, they didn't see that there could be a business case or commercial returns on that. And of course, in today's world, we've got the added challenge now of climate change. So let's have a look at a few of these. Um, Pietro, just starting with you for the TB Alliance, uh, if, we, if you think about funding challenges from donors, um, which ones do you see and, and, and how are they affecting you? So that there's, um, there's a number of funding challenges, right? And a number of issues behind those funding challenges. Uh, uh, say we could begin. I'm, I'm actually in New York for the multi-stakeholder meeting on TB as we prepare for the high-level meeting later this year. And the, the overarching challenge is one of political will. Uh, as we've seen uh, with COVID, when there was uh, political will and there was huge funding, massive progress was made in, in an unbelievably short time. Um, we don't see that, unfortunately, in the TB world, and, and I'd argue more widely in the PDP world. So we are very thankful of, for the generous support that the, that the funding community provides, but it is stagnating at present. So when we look at the recent competitive calls in the PDP space, um, the, the funding ceilings have not increased over time. So the, while, while we are in a great place, right? There, is, there are these ring-fenced funds that support PDPs, they haven't been growing over time. And this is before we even touch upon the challenge of, of, of something like COVID, you know, to some degree sucking all the air out of the room in the global health space. Uh, and, and these unfortunate realities are currently exacerbated by, by the international um, challenges we face. So uh, war in Ukraine, uh, climate um, changes, challenges around food pricing and hunger. These are all very important issues that that um, uh, are brought to the to the fore, and that uh, policymakers in in funding countries and donor countries have to prioritize and address. And what we are seeing is continued challenges, right? So there are there is a certain level of resources, and I in no way want to discount. Um, just how much the donor community is doing for us. But the, the challenges remain. We don't see a positive trend in funding. Um, we don't see a, a, a great diversity of funders. Um, there's there's a, a, a relatively small cohort of very generous governments. And I, I think uh, all, of, all of my colleagues here, everyone that's represented on this call, going back to the same wells. And so Clearly, there is an issue around financial bandwidth, but also around all the challenges that we face in the global space and um, the, the, the very nature of the business we're in. So neglected tropical diseases, it's, it's very much in the definition. All right. So um, again, not to belittle the support we receive, but when we look at the international situation, we don't see growth in funding. And we don't see the, um, uh, the emergence of a new set of, of funders to help continue to support the research and development work that we do. Yeah, no, you make your points very clearly, Pietro, about these competing priorities, shifting priorities. Um, Monique, what Pietro was saying there was saying that uh, for TB, uh, funding is stagnating. Is, is that what you're seeing in DNDI? Uh, clearly, yes. Um, we we are seeing what Pietro is seeing. Uh, for us, also the um, the funding for research and development uh, for neglected diseases is really insufficient. It's unpredictable. Uh, it's short term and project specific. Um, so it's makes it very difficult to plan and to sustain um, activities. Um, and, 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 and like, like Pietro was saying, uh, that, you know, there's so much happening in the world, you know, as you settle down, there's a pandemic comes, um, and, and, you know, like COVID-19 and then everything shifts, everybody shifts, the donor money, everybody's, you know, seeing this pandemic and really, uh, leaving behind even these poor people that are dying, 
because they don't have treatments or they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance or they have TB, you know, there are these diseases that really are there all the time. And because of poverty, the poverty, the can't really go away. So uh, there's all that. Um, and so we need to explore, uh, uh, you know, new funding uh, models. Uh, if we have to survive, I have to diversify funding uh, uh, sources and sustain our activities. And that's what we are trying to do. Uh, we have also been calling upon our partners to see how they can chip in, uh, especially even, you know, like governments in, you know, like uh, in uh, low income countries like my own, you know, at least if they can, you know, put something in, 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 in the back bucket for for the neglected patients or for you know uh, MR or TB you know if if there's that uh, contribution from government it sends a very strong uh, message and also political will of willingness to, to to work together. So I think yeah absolutely it'll be really interesting to find out what you uh, are coming up with for new funding models. Uh, Laura, let me bring you into the conversation about whether in your sphere you're seeing the same challenges that pietro and monique have just outlined um, and their funding pool is stagnating what, what's the situation uh, for guard p well i think first of all it's worth re restating that the whole reason guard p was set up was because investment in developing new antibacterials in particular which is our current focus uh was just missing and this is why so many small companies continue to uh, go into liquidation so investment in the area per se irrespective of what type of organization you are um, is challenging um, we're very lucky uh, we're a young organization we have received significant funding and we're very grateful for that of course we need more like everyone else who does r d of new treatments and uh, you know it's important that non-profit organizations that make a long-term commitment to develop these new treatments for these vulnerable and neglected populations wherever they are throughout the world is able to have the sustainable financing for that long-term commitment um, but i you know i would draw attention to the fact that we are very much at the whim of the political systems that fund us and politicians tend to have very much a five-year uh forward-looking uh view of the world and you know they're still reeling from dealing with the covid pandemic and you know everything get does get wrapped up in it and somehow there is this view that it's a finite pot of funding and that if you take it out for one thing you can't take it out for the others without realizing this interconnectedness you mentioned climate change earlier we're a, we saw so clearly with covid that infections travel the world very very rapidly and so what might not be your problem today will almost certainly be your country's problem tomorrow or your population's problem tomorrow. And I think it, it does uh, behove uh, our political systems to really step up more than just the few that are, you know, G7, G20, you know, these are their populations that are going to benefit. And I think we should, you know, encourage our relationships with these uh, countries and, and, you know, help them to understand what the challenges are for this field. I think that's very interesting, Laura. Let me just ask, just pick up on that before we look at uh, funding models and we bring in the question of pharma and uh, what you can expect them to do, because as we see, yes, the public donors have many competing priorities. I'm just wondering, Monique, climate change, I mean, is that a challenge? because all the money is going into uh, uh, mitigation or adaptation or would that be an opportunity uh, for you and the same question for pietro whether climate change is an opportunity or is it a is it a challenge M monique first so uh, climate change could uh, could be both um, have a positive or negative effects uh, on the funding for neglected diseases uh, on the other hand, um, climate change can create new opportunities for funding. Uh, and another, it can also divert funding from, from, from neglected diseases uh, towards other global issues. So it's um, both ways. What, so to respond you... to the current, okay. 
So where do you see the opportunity? The opportunity would be interesting to hear. Where do you see the opportunity uh, for you with climate change? So um, the opportunity would be in, in supporting research um, uh, in terms of its relationship with climate change and NTDs, because now with the climate change, there are a lot of uh, uh, neglected, it's exacerbating some of the neglected diseases, such as the leishmaniasis, the Chagas disease, as well as dengue. Uh, so, you know, so you see an opportunity that if they support uh, this climate change uh, diseases, in a way they will be supporting the NTDs. Also, um, if the donor funding, you know, could be also community-based, uh, that way as they um, deal with climate change uh, within the community, uh, it, you know, this is where the neglected diseases are. So it will, you know, uh, also be uh, helping with the neglected diseases. So really uh, the changing pattern in terms of uh, transmission and in terms of uh, prevalence of, 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 of these uh, uh, neglected diseases and climate change uh, is bringing about, I think we need to work together with our partners uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, reduce this. So there's that, it brings in together the partnerships, it comes back to partnerships and that's an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Pietro, what about climate change uh, in the TB space? Is it seen as a, a challenge or an opportunity for donor funding? Again, echoing a little bit and building on what Monique said, you know, a, a bit of both, right? So, that, but to focus on on the opportunities there, um, climate change is impacting the most marginalized populations in LMIC countries. Um, these populations uh, are the most vulnerable. Uh, when we look at, for example, the European context, there's a great movement around uh, migratory flows and refugees. If nothing else, this raises the attention and it, to, to make a full circle clear, the, the prioritization for political decision making in uh, higher income countries. So in that regard, it is an opportunity. Um, I, in, in no way trying to be flippant, it is also a distraction, right? Because we know that there's um, the climate issue has become front and central in, in development, more broadly speaking. So that is where the focus is, and that is where the lion's share of resources uh, are, in, are increasingly being allocated. So certainly um, in terms of our funding challenges and in, and in terms of ensuring in, in our case, right, looking at, at, at my own small Chasquardé, that, that TB stays at the forefront uh, of decision makers and policy makers, it is linking the TB issue um, in a, in a variety of, of fashions to the issue of climate. And, and if I could, just a small comment from our previous conversation and something that, um, that Monique said that really uh, I, I think bears underlining. Uh, the, the challenges around funding are multiple, uh, but there's also the issue of the quality of funding. And so something that was said that I think that resonated a great deal with me is the fact that funding is increasingly project-based and this is um, quite challenging for our R&D colleagues because it becomes shorter term and because it becomes that much more difficult to be flexible and to turn on a dime when it comes to um, new findings in the course of the research. So uh, a plea there, if I could, is not only around the quantity of funding but also the quality and how we can ensure that funding for the kind of work that that all of us do remains as as um, loosely restricted as possible um, going forward. Thank you. So well, thank you. Yes, uh, the the call which I think many organisations make for non earmarked funds. So yeah. we've all seen that it's a difficult space to operate in with public donors and funding at the moment. The other part of the equation, of course, is the pharmaceutical. Uh, companies, the the, the private uh, sector. So, uh, Pietro, I mean, do you see that uh, big pharma 
would it ever come back to the AMR drug development space or is it going to be or TB space or is it going to be just uh, SMEs and interested to get Laura and Monique's view on this. Uh, what do you see and what do you think or what would you like uh, pharma the pharmaceutical industry to do because they are part of this partnership? So speaking, um, painting a very broad brush here. Um, so so hoping that the audience won't call me on this, but we do see um, a lessening interest on the part of pharma when it comes to infectious diseases. I think we can agree that broadly speaking, that is one of the challenges we face. Um, and and this comes back to, and I'm, and I'm out of my lane here, I'm sure Laura will have a great deal more to say about this, but um, this does have to do with the financial incentives for, for pharma um, with the current uh, economic models that that that, that they are, they operate within, so uh, that is the challenge. The opportunity, of course, is, is that the tremendous R and D muscle that uh, private sector pharma brings to the table can in no way be neglected or ignored. And certainly, when I speak for, for TB Alliance, we do have a vast array of scientific partnerships that are absolutely key front and center to the to the r d work that we do um, all the way to to the identification of compounds that do come from pharma and that we're now working with um, all th that, that run the gamut so there is a i i'd sound a, a warning bell um, and say that we do need to look at different models that will ensure that pharma remains engaged in research um, for for the diseases that we work on, and and looking at at different elements and models that that would enable that that would make sense commercially for our private sector pharma uh, companies to um, continue to to engage with us. And Pietro, that, that when you talk about these new models, you're talking about financial incentives for R and D, for example. Yeah. Yes. So looking, you know, not only not only at the push incentives, but also at the pull incentives. I'm sure I'm sure others have more to say, but we we see a a, a great deal of um, of interest around concepts like a subscription model for antibiotic development. There there's a number of different uh, opportunities or, that are being bandied about, and um, to to continue to to encourage pharma to to work with us. Now, um, part of the um, the solution and the challenge, of course, is that pharma is now to some degree involved in competing with PDPs um, to secure some of the public and philanthropic monies um, that in the past were mainly challenged through us. Now, I, I don't want to overstate that, uh, but it's also looking at opportunities so that, as, as you said, different models that can continue to incentivize pharma's participation in the work that we do. Uh, without the the, the zero sum element. Yeah. Now that's very interesting. Looking at these different uh, models because they do need to be encouraged. Laura, what is your view on how we in, encourage uh, the pharma industry uh, to do more drug development? Uh, any thoughts on the different models? I think that uh, Pietro mentioned a subscription model, but what really needs to be done to make sure that they do play a part and play their role, step up in other words? Well, I think we need to view this in several ways because for antibiotics, I, you know, antibacterial drugs over the last 20 years, the, it's not been very common for a large pharmaceutical company to do everything from discovery right the way through to getting a drug approved and making it accessible or getting it approved, let alone making it accessible in just the few countries. I mean, it may surprise this audience that many new antibiotics are only available to less than 10 countries. So, you know, there's a, a huge amount of work to be done there. But because of this, the you know many of those experts that were in large pharma moved into small companies or other organizations, including academia, and some indeed moved to Guard P. Uh, but it's important to say that we need every person who's involved, has the expertise and the knowledge and the capabilities to fill what was the gap filled with just large pharmaceutical companies, now fill in different roles throughout the pipeline you know, from start right the way to finish. So, 
because of this, there's the various different funding mechanisms that have arisen over the last few years. So that the sort of the public funding mechanisms. And so we have, yes, the push funding, which means that organizations, national and international funding agencies, or CARBEX or uh, Repair Impact Fund, for instance, um, they will fund projects that have not yet gone into uh, patients. And they'll start to push them through the pipeline. And there has been a significant amount of funding available for things that have been somewhat de-risked, uh, you know, slightly past the early discovery and in, in go through to phase one first in man studies. And then after that, there is a bit of a gap. And this is what pool funding is supposed to do. It's supposed to pull those uh, first in man study drugs that look as if they have the potential to treat these infections through the pipeline. And that is what many countries have, have felt uh, unable to work out what the mechanism should be. What is the model of their pool funding? So meanwhile, other uh, organizations such as the AMR Action Fund has, has been established and they're set up to bring two to four treatments through the, the pipeline to patients. But of course, it doesn't matter who by whose estimate it's, it's considered that six to 10 new treatments will be needed at a minimum. So this won't fill all the gap either. And this is why Guard P will step in with to do development and particularly on drugs that otherwise would not be developed. And this is the, uh, what we've been doing with the STI phase three program on zoliflodacin for gonorrhea. So, it, you know, the whole system has changed and the funding models have changed and are continuing to change. So the only real pull incentive that's been up and running for a, a little while now is the UK system, which is called the, you know, often called the, the Netflix subscription model. But the UK has, you know, a very small percentage of the global antibiotic market. So unless a similar type of model is introduced in many other countries, that's not going to be the complete solution. So you still need to fund organizations such as Guard P, as well as small companies to do the development work. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I'm getting a lot of questions in from the, the, the speakers. I'm just going to have a look at those. Uh, Monique, you mentioned uh, new uh, funding models right at the beginning of this conversation. Um, is the one that uh, is the one area where you uh, you would really like uh, a pharma to to focus on a particular model? Okay, so uh, from our experience, um, uh, you know, as I said from the beginning, that you know, because there was then uh, a profit uh, the, like a model. Uh, for drug development and there was no lack of incentive and therefore then uh, the neglected populations and there was no drug development for the neglected populations uh, but over the years we have um, you know have had a good experience now working with uh, with pharma uh, this is quite uh, crucial in our work and uh, we have a uh, partnered in a uh, critical uh, number of pharmaceutical with a number of pharmaceutical companies uh, and to facilitate development of treatments um, and so we still uh, think that yes there should be alternative uh, drug development models uh, for non-profit um, and, and that um, you know should be proposed uh, for implementation over the years um, but uh, I, I think that the, uh, the, the, the profit model, uh, which is there in some, you know, with some companies can still, you know, they're, they're propagating it, it can still work, but I think that we need the collaborative model, an open source model, or bits and pieces from various models and put them together uh, so that we can, uh, we can really achieve uh, treatments for neglected uh, populations uh, in all our three organizations. We are actually looking at uh, the less privileged, uh, you know, the, um, the ones that are very poor and do not have uh, uh, treatments. So yes, we can 
all the, I agree with Pietro and I agree with Laura what they have discussed. So let's have a look at some of the audience questions, and we have uh, many, and to a certain extent, I'm just going in the order that they uh, came in. Um, now, uh, just raise your hand, speakers, I think, because we've got so many. I'm just probably not going to be able to get all of your views on one question. So if there's somebody who would like to take this one, clinical trials are called trials because they never go to plan. Could the speakers explain some key barriers they encountered in performing their phase three trials and how they overcame them? So if there's somebody who would like to take that one on, uh, then raise your raise your hand. The, the, the barriers once uh, you're getting to the end of the uh, trial period. If I don't see anybody not um, raising their hand, I move on to one of the many other questions. Laura. So um, obviously we haven't reported on our trial yet, but I think a sort of generic factor for trials um, is to ensure you're car carrying them out in a population that has the disease which you are actually hoping to use your treatment for. Um, so, you know, drug if you're developing a treatment for drug resistant infections, you need carry that out in a population that has that infection. Um, but often, if it's the greatest burden in low and middle income countries, then they will need help to get the capacity to do the trials and the resources to set up trial sites. So a lot of the things that GARP has been doing is establishing sites in South Africa and India, for instance, to carry out our trials. And the Wellcome Trust has just established a uh, you know, trial network in Asia. So this is a, has been a big barrier. Um, but the other barrier really is making sure that uh, you can recruit the patients in a timely manner. And of course, everyone was very worried that with COVID and with ongoing trials, that was gonna have a massive impact. Um, less of an impact than I think one predicted at the time. But I would say establishing the capabilities, the technicalities, bringing the teams with you to do high quality clinical trials in new and different settings to those that were established maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, as maybe, you rightly said. Yeah, yeah clear, clear, please. Just, just to add an element to that, um, one of the things that we have found that has been very helpful in, um, in addressing all, all the surprises that one has along the way in, in trials, and specifically in phase three trials, is um, investing quite a bit in terms of the development of our, of our community engagement work. So ensuring that uh, we are working with grassroots organizations um, in, in parallel to the trial sites and all that comes with that, so that the, addressing exactly what Laura is saying, that the, the communities understand what we're doing, um, they help us, they support the, the, the trial participants, um, and that this information is then used and, and disseminated um, as effectively and, and as efficiently as possible in the community so that the, the folks we are working with feel that they are part of a process and part of a, of a solution as opposed um, to being passive participants in a trial, if, if that makes any sense. No, absolutely. As you've said, very important to get uh, the trials where the people are who have uh, these uh, diseases. I'm sure Monique would uh, agree. Yes. <laughs> yes, I completely agree. I put up my hand to say exactly the same what Pietro was saying. Uh, I really agree. Uh, community engagement is key, but also to have, um, you know, uh, political well buy-in from uh, the countries, the, the heads, the ministers of health, you know, have them all engaged, let them know what you're doing, and then you have their support. So I think it helps uh, in that as well. So you've been talking about partnerships, we've been talking about partnerships with uh, governments, uh, with pharma, of course there's academia. So there's a question here which says many new compounds with antibacterial potential are being investigated by academic researchers. What is the mechanism for these being adopted by Gard, P and others? So Laura, how do you work with academic researchers when they've uh, they're looking at new compounds with antibacterial potential. Okay, so thank you for that question. So we're not a funding agency, so we don't ever have a call saying, you know, tell us about your wonderful new drug and 
we will fund you to do the next steps. Uh, what we do, um, we, you know, we do have a small discovery and exploratory research program. Uh, it's one of the ones that I lead. So we've talked mostly about clinical development so far, which is the main focus of GARP, also with access. But coming back to how do we identify the groups we're working with? Well, we are very open about our strategy for our discovery and exploratory research work. And it comes back to this ethos of filling gaps that no one else will fill. So we are um, identify exactly what we want to do. We set up uh, collaborations with large pharma and other organizations that share libraries with us, for instance, that have never been screened against drug, particular drug resistant bacteria. And we will, they share these in kind, a lot of know-how and we will screen them. But how do, how do academia come in? Well, we have projects where some of the academic teams have, you know, it's very clear that what they're doing would help fit some of the things that we want to do. And we will go out and approach those. So uh, at GARP, we're always scanning the literature, we're always looking at what's going on um, at conferences. We listen to people, we go to lots of small meetings and listen to the things that people are doing. And if they're doing things that we think would really help us, we will then approach them. Sometimes people do come to us, um, but it's, it's more often the other way around. And we are currently uh, just setting up two new projects with two universities in South America, as it happens. And, uh, you know, we're looking as that hopefully will form the base of a new, much bigger consortium that we'll be establishing later this year. So we, we're proactive to identify those that can help us fill the gaps. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for for that. There's another question here, which um, I uh, invite any of our speakers to pick up on whether you see that this um, private public uh, partnerships occupying a space in commercial markets, carrying products through all phases of development and then sustaining them on the market. Are there any cases or contacts where or context rather, where you see this happening successfully. If anybody would like to pick up on that, so that uh, it's not just about getting them to market, but to make sure that they are used on the market. I think that's most probably where that comes from. Uh, Pietro and then Monique. So just, just to get the conversation started, I um, thank you for the question. and. At the end of the day, that's why we're here, right? So it's not just developing a new drug or a new product. Unless we're getting it to the people that need it, we have not been successful. And certainly, speaking for TB Alliance, we are increasingly focusing on the access work. Now, this isn't grassroots uh, access work. This is working at the level of WHO and with uh, NTD programs at country level to ensure that they are aware uh, of new drugs coming to market. and and how these are approved and, and how they may want to take advantage of them, making sure that they're aware when, when they're on the, 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 the GDF roster and all that comes with that. Um, the, the other element that I would add is that we, as, as, a, as an access model, work with production uh, of our drugs, of Pretominate in this case, uh, with generic producers in, in countries like India. And our model is predicated on having um, multiple generic producers involved in production and commercialization, again, as an effort to, to encourage competition, lower prices, and, and support availability and access and adoption. So just, just to get the ball rolling, we, we could spend quite a bit <clears throat> more time on this issue. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And indeed, I'll come to Monique. There's a, there's another question on access because, of course, it is very, very important. You just don't want to develop them. You've got to get to them to the people in need. And uh, just to say that somebody's also asking, what are the mechanisms to ensure that they're accessible to the population with the greatest burden, especially in low and middle income countries? So, Monique, yes, over to, over to you about yeah. access to these uh, antibiotics and other drugs need, that are needed. Yes, so just like Petra was saying, um, uh, DMDI is developing all these uh, uh, treatments for neglected uh, uh, diseases, but it's in the best interest of the patients that they do get these treatments. Otherwise, we are doing nothing. If they don't get it, uh, we are not helping. 
So it's our, in, our, in our best interest that uh, we, we uh, uh, take access seriously, which we are doing now. Um, uh, and we have programs uh, for access in various diseases. So we work very closely with the ministries of health. We can't do this alone, the WHO and others. Um, and, and we are also interested in uh, the treatments that we are producing, um, in whether how they will be available uh, for the populations. And in fact, if, if, if we look at some of the diseases that we work in, sometimes there's just one treatment option. And so if um, that treatment option is not accessible, then there's quite a number of uh, populations that uh, uh, don't have this treatment. So it's very, very important that we take access into consideration, but sometimes uh, for, for you to be able to treat a disease, you also have to be able to diagnose it, yeah? So that it is a diagnosis and a treatment. So sometimes we overlook the diagnosis so we can't treat the patient. So this need to go hand in hand. Are the diagnostic tools available so that we can uh, then uh, be able to you know, say somebody has this disease and be able to treat them. Um, so that is also key. And, you know, in our interest now, we're trying to make sure that, you know, we're able to diagnose and treat and preferably at home. That's where we are moving to. Are these treatments uh, uh, available? Are they uh, affordable? Are they um, easy to use? And preferably, they should be all so that you can test and treat near, near somebody's home and not going to a hospital. So yes, that's really, that's really interesting. Yes, the, well, yes, the, the, the whole chain, the whole journey from diagnostics to uh, treatment and treatment at home. There's another question here, Monique, uh, which may be one for you. Uh, what conditions are required to be created locally to ensure any type of drug development promotion can be done in any part of the world. Um, it's written here in compliance, reliable, useful for populations. Um, so I think uh, what I've understood from that question is yes, about um, what conditions do you need to be able to do drug development promotion in the context you work in? Yeah, so I will, I will probably um, uh, take it in terms of um, uh, the clinical trials, because if you are developing, uh, drug development is at very different stages of development, yeah? Uh, and for example, um, we're mainly, uh, you know, in the low middle income countries, uh, we are mainly doing like a phase three uh, clinical trials. Um, uh, and, and so there are international regulations that guide how you do these trials. Uh, and, and, and so there has to be capacity building, for example, uh, for uh, the, the people in those low middle income countries to be able to um, abide by the uh, national, international or regional rules, especially not international uh, rules, so that whatever results are obtained from these trials, uh, you know, uh, can, can, can be adopted. Um, yeah, so it depends where the development is, but for each sector, there are a set of a set of a set of a set of regulations. Yeah. Um, perhaps a question, Pietro. I uh, I ha hand you this one, and it's most probably uh, we're coming to the end of our discussion. And thank you, everybody, for such great questions. Um, the questioner says, even though you've all clearly articulated the distinct missions of your organisations. Do you sometimes find yourself competing for the attention of the same funders? If so, what can be done to mitigate that? I, I directed that one to you, Pietro, because you said also that there was this small group of funders um, and that you would obviously quite like to expand that group. But your, your thoughts briefly on that question. So I, the, the short answer is yes, there is an element of competition, all right, within if, if one even looks at the competitive calls that some of the funders use to allocate funding and awards to uh, PDPs, uh, we are, if you will, pre-selected and, and, uh, and thrown in the ring and have to compete for those funds. I, I would say 
that there is um, a good degree of collaboration across the global health PDPs. So the, the competition is, is a healthy and fair one. And there's quite a bit of interaction with the decision makers in the donor agencies. So this is not um, for, for the participants, this is in no way who has the, the, the pointiest elbows to, to get in front of a, a USAID or an FCDO. We are dealing with professionals here. Uh, we work in the context of their stated priorities and strategies and we are interacting with them on a regular basis as we work closely with our sister PDPs. So is there an element of competition? Absolutely. Um, I would say that it's a healthy competition in terms of ensuring that the limited resources that are available are allocated in the best possible manner. Um, but we do share information, we do collaborate across the PDP sphere. And as a matter of fact, both our our donor cohort and the PDPs meet regularly together to address the, the challenges that we face. So uh, I, I don't want to overstate the competitive element of the, of the nature of our work. I would rather emphasize the fact that there is uh, a, a great degree of concert and coordination. I've, I have quite a background in other sectors in development where that wasn't quite the case. So I've been very pleasantly um, uh, surprised by the degree to which we do partner and work with one another. And that is not only in the context of the PDPs, but also with our, with our key funders. Well, thank you very, very much for ending on that note. Uh, competition, yes, we've seen there's competition for uh, funding for antibiotics and for these neglected diseases. We've seen also, though, that there's collaboration. Uh, there's collaboration in the public-private partnerships. And I think we've seen a good example of collaboration during this discussion for the last hour with three different organizations explaining to you the value of the public-private partnership, this non this non-profit drug development model. If you would like uh, to listen to this or to share the recording, you will see on the screen where you can pick it up. And of course, this is certainly not the end of the discussion. We will have other events and many of you will know that the World Health Assembly is happening here in Geneva at the end of May. And Guard P again will be hosting another discussion. That's an in-person discussion on tackling the growing pandemic of drug resistant infections. So we hope that many of you will attend that uh, or listen to it and ask again such insightful questions. So thank you very, very, very much, Laura Piddock from Guard P, Monique Vasuna from DNDI and Pietro Turilli from the TB Alliance. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.